control of this roaming dog population, and they only talk about control because of the situation of rabies. Significant. Ninth, up to the 19th century, the British, the, there wasn't much until the British came in. When the British came in, they started mass killing of dogs, shooting primarily. After independence, they stopped the shooting and they started still the Indian government this time with electrocution. And what, what, if people complained, they would go to an area with the shooting first. And then they, the uh, animal control, the police actually, would take out their rifles and they would start killing whatever dog they could, could find and then take the bodies away. Well, people got upset, so then they started rounding up the dogs and electrocuting them. That was the prime way of uh, killing them. Well, in the 1960s, animal rights organizations started to form, and they had a 30-year campaign to end euthanasia. And I don't mean, uh, I mean really end euthanasia. And the laws were passed in India where you can only, the government can only euthanize a dog if it's rabid or very sick or a total danger to society. That is the law. Unfortunately, that isn't what takes place. Recently, uh, in uh, one of the cities, major cities in Kashmir, the city set out to kill 100,000 dogs at a time. They said there was a severe dog problem. They were having a, an, um, rabies. They went to kill 100,000 dogs was their target. The animal rights organization stepped in and they stopped it, but 500 dogs had been killed. And the method of killing was strychnine, poisoning the, a horrible death. They don't have the money or the means to give anesthetic and do what we do here in the United States. So um, the, in 2001, they developed, as a result of the very strong animal rights organizations, they set upon the ABC rules, the animal birth control rules. And all they asked the government to do was to trap the dogs. The NGOs raised the money to sterilize, to vaccinate, and then they released the dogs back into their area. The problem, and this has been studied worldwide, in the United States and the World Health Organization and World Welfare Fund, in order for any ABC program to be effective, you have to sterilize and vaccinate 70% of all the dogs within a six-month period in an area because there's two cycles a year, and if you don't get 70%, you, have, you haven't solved your problem. There is no way in India they can reach 70%. But still, they have been lowering the rabies deaths to a few years ago, it was 18,000 instead of the 20,000. They're saying, the, uh, the federal, the Animal Welfare Board of India says it's, it's sterilizing 70,000 dogs a year of this 25 million population. Even that's a high number because when I looked at the various NGOs, and they tell you they're so proud of how many they're sterilizing. The most is 500 a month or 4,800 a year. That's a lot of sterilizations for a little organization to carry out. And, um, but still, it, it's hard to even add up to this 70,000. So what does it mean for the dogs of India? Life expectancy, according to the, um, the various animal rights organizations and the scientists and their studies is 1.3 years at birth. There's a 70% adult survival rate for a female dog if she's spayed. If she's not spayed, it's less. So 3.8 years. And they did studies in the United States and Baltimore and actually in the United States it's the same for a roaming dog. 3.8 years. 70% survival rate. And uh, the studies on feral cats is if they're not taken care of, it's three years. So I found some pictures of shelters. This is in Defense of Animals, which is a major NGO in Mumbai. And this, it's like Mexico, open dog shelters. 
We've all seen the pictures of Mexico, because only they have fewer dogs here because the dogs are usually trapped, spayed, and released. These are dogs who are too sick to release. No one is going to come and adopt them. Often these people pick up puppies, and, they tr and you can see on their internet sites, they try to get the puppies adopted. They're hardly ever adopted. And so the, con the consequence is a situation like the Lodi Garden is so unique, where you have the dogs aren't going to be adopted, but these people care for them. So these dogs probably will live beyond the 3.8 years. And they are well tended. They have nice coats for the most part. They're friendly. They're gentle. They're, they're just wonderful dogs. I wanted to take everyone home. Let's look at the pariah dogs. Now, it's interesting. It's called pariah. We all know what pariah means. But pariah, actually, it's pariah is part of, in Tamil Nadu, it's, it was one of the uh, groups, one of the uh, subgroups. And years and years ago, hundreds of years ago, they were actually rulers of a part of India. Then they were overtaken and they became the laborers. Paraya, paria means drum. And some of them became the drum beaters and others became the laborers. When the British came in, Pariah, as they said it, and they also said pie dog. That became the word for outcast. And dogs were considered, with the mass killing by the British, outcasts. And that's how the word pariah dog came about. So the dog rescue people in India, particularly welfare of stray dogs in Mumbai, have coined the phrase Indian native dog, in dog. So that's what we'll refer to them now. And these are, this is a classic in-dog. And these are um, photos that were taken by a woman who started the Pariah Dog Club. And uh, she's one of the principal people in welfare stray dogs in Mumbai. And they have a wonderful blog. And she went throughout India to tiger reserves and to all these uh, outlying places to gather photos of what would be the in-dog. And a study by um, Swedes a Swedish study of the mitochondri mitochondrial uh, DNA has shown that the pariah dog, which exists in, uh, in India, the in-dog, it has the same um, DNA, mitochondrial DNA, as our regular dogs, unlike the Australian dingo, which is a unique uh, subset. Uh, but these dogs are very different from the dogs of China and other parts of Asia. So they call it the long-term pariah morphotype. And this is the description, just, just as you would have the American Kennel Club describing what is the perfect confirmation. This is the historic confirmation of the in-dog. Medium size, 20 to 25 inches at the shoulder, the weight of 28 to 45 pounds, pointed erect ears, wedge-shaped wedge head with a long pointed muzzle, a long curved tail, very much like an Akita, some of the northern dogs, or the other, um, what are known as pariah dogs, the ones that are officially recognized, the Carolina dog here in the United States, the Canaan dog from Israel, and the African Basinji. Those are the three recognized breeds of pariah dogs. Uh, and then a short coat. And surprisingly, it can go from light tan to rust. That's the most common. You can get the piebald mixture like this one, who she considered to be the perfect example of an in-dog. And you sometimes find black and tan. So these are her photos of in-dogs from the tribal region. And what she pointed out is that often she couldn't get a picture of a dog alone because people were so proud of their dogs. Now, mind you, they're proud of their dogs, but they don't regularly feed them, she found out. Here's another example, the light-colored dog. Now, these are going to be dogs from different uh, regions. In Maharashtra, these mostly are pictures from the inside and on the outskirts of a tiger reserve. And um, uh, if the one at the top, is, um, is you can see the goat, and this is a livestock guarding dog. In the Tiger Reserve, most of the pariah dogs 
had been used for hunting. But hunting has been banned in India, and now there are fewer dogs actually in the villages, and many of them now are mongrels. Dogs are coming, mixed breed dogs. 50% uh, she said are mixed breed dogs now in the villages where you didn't have that before. And the dogs are restricted to guarding and livestock guarding, you know, house guarding and livestock guarding. 